This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 253. Ben, almost five years ago now, we sat down with two microphones and not a clue what we were doing. We learned this week that we have passed the 5 million all-time download milestone, which is still mind-blowing considering... Considering how we started, it's unbelievable to me. Yep. Are, are you implying that we know what we're doing now? Uh, no, I'm just affirming we had no idea what we were doing then. I'm not making any correlation between the two. Um, and then when I told you that today, you said, look at this. You just passed 15 million views on your Common Sense Investing YouTube channel. Yeah, I only knew that because I got a big notification from YouTube saying, you <laughs> hit this milestone, 15 million. Oh, wow, that's... It's a lot of views. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. Uh, anyway, this week is a super interesting episode and rather unique. You kicked it off up front by following up with a, a research that helped you with the episode a couple weeks ago. Yep, so a professor at, uh, at Queens. We'll, we'll give him a proper introduction in the, in the when we go to that topic. But yeah, we discussed with him uh, complexity and financial products. Uh, with Paul Caluso from Queen's University. So, I mean, that was, in, in my opinion, an absolutely fascinating, practical uh, discussion yep. of some some really cool research. And from there, we jump into a review of episode 39 with Canadian financial journalist Rob Carrick of the Globe and Mail. And maybe you're too young, Ben. Did you ever own a BlackBerry? I'm not that young. Blackberries were a thing when I was I'm not saying they were a adult. thing, but you're not exactly, like what what model of iPhone do you now have? Yeah, no, I, I never owned a BlackBerry. That's fair. Okay. Okay. But I was I'm around not, when Blackberries were popular. I'm not being aged. I'm just saying I don't I didn't think it was a thing for you. Anyway, so this week we have something pretty cool with uh, the Canadian journalist who co-authored the book about the downfall of BlackBerry, which has now been made into a feature movie. The book is called Losing the Signal, which we'll do a quick review of. And the co-author is Sean Silkoff, and the movie is called BlackBerry, which has its North American release on May 12th. And of course, we have the after show for the three of you to stick around. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention that we've launched our continuing education credit platform, uh, which it currently has 10 CE courses that are accredited by, accredited by FP Canada. That's for people who have their CFP or their QAFP and by IROC for people who are registered. Well, I guess it's CERO now. CERO. CERO, yep. the, the, new, the new regulatory body. Uh, so accredited on both of those, uh, there are 10 courses, which are really sets of questions based on podca- Rational Reminder podcast episodes. There are 11 credits available because the Robert Merton episode was accredited for two credits, which is not surprising because it was a <laughs> two hour long episode with Robert Merton. You, you, I mean, you would hope it would get two credits. Yeah, uh, We're charging $150 per year for this subscription. Um, a handful of people did already sign up, which is awesome because the only way we've announced it is at the back end of a previous episode. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about it at the front end this time and we'll try and post it on our social media, on PWL social media and stuff like that too. Um, and I just want to say that the, the, the plan is we've kind of rolled this out as a soft launch. Um, if there's interest, so if a few people have signed up already, if, if we see that there's interest, that people want this product, then we will continue to develop, to develop more courses based on podcast episodes and probably based on white papers as well. So I think we could make a pretty cool learning environment in there, but we don't want to dump a bunch of resources into it until we see there's a bit of right. interest. So if if you're an advisor or a financial planner who needs CE credits and thinks that you would want to get involved with um, our CE courses, then it would be great if you could sign up to show your interest so that we know that people are interested. Well put. Um, yeah. I also wanted to mention that if you are listening and know someone in Canada who's still investing in high fee mutual funds or if they're paying fees to a financial advisor but maybe not getting comprehensive advice, uh, you can ask them to talk to us. Um, it's not there must be a few. To, yeah, well, we, we know. We know, <laughs> we know there's guys. a I, few. I looked at the data on this because I don't like saying things that aren't supported by data. Really? Yeah. Uh, so Morningstar's 2022 Global Investor Experience study found that Canadians pay an asset weighted fee of 1.9% on their asset allocation mutual funds and 1.76% on their equity funds. 
and ETFs in Canada. So that's that's the mutual fund market. ETFs in Canada only make up 11% of the market. So the vast wow. majority of dollars in Canada are still in mutual funds, and most of those dollars are in uh, in these high fee funds. 66% of the Canadian mutual fund market is in commission based funds. And as we talked about in a recent episode on uh, financial advice, commission based advice is questionable at best. Anyway, so. We know a lot of our listeners are DIY investors, which is great, and that's why they're listening. But if you know someone who's in Canada who is in investing in high fee mutual funds, um, tell them to reach out to us, and we'll we'll uh, try and help them. Love it. All right, Ben, let's go to the episode. Welcome to episode two fifty three of the podcast. All right, so today we this is not a, a typical. Uh, guest episode, but we have two guests. So uh, it's kind of a fun format today. Uh, right now, what we're going to do is discuss the paper Complex Instruments Have Increased Risk and Reduced Performance at Mutual Funds, which is a paper published in the Critical Finance Review. This is a paper that I referenced when we discussed covered calls. Like in, in my research on that, which we talked about in a previous episode, uh, this is one of the papers that I referenced. And when I put those notes together, I actually sent a note to one of the co-authors just saying like, hey, I'm putting together uh, some research on covered calls and I'm referencing your paper. Would you mind just taking a look at my notes? And uh, so Paul Caluso, it was, was, that's who that was. And he was gracious enough to uh, read through my notes and help did me. You know, did you know Paul before? Had you interacted with him before this? Yeah. Okay. So he, he was a listener. You knew him before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I've, I've chatted to him a few times beforehand. So so I, cool. I knew about this paper, um, and it just fits so well with the covered call stuff. So I had it in there, and then mm-hmm. as I was going through it, it's you know there's there's a lot of fairly complex information. We haven't spent a ton of time uh, working on options and other complex strategies, so I just wanted a second set of eyes. Anyway, so Paul was Paul was nice enough to look at the notes, and and he and his co-authors gave uh, gave some really helpful feedback that helped that topic. Um, and then I just kind of thought maybe it would be cool to have Paul come on and talk about the paper, which he agreed to do. And I think it was a really, really in- insightful conversation. I was really insightful. Plus he's a really nice guy. It was really fun. So Paul is an associate professor of finance and taller family fellow of finance in the Smith school of business at Queens university in Kingston. He received his PhD in finance from Rutgers business school and a BA in economics from Williams college. Yep. It's a good introduction. Um, good introduction. Good conversation. So yeah, really, really, really interesting. And uh, I'm not going to say anything else because Paul Paul gives all the all the detail and nuance and and opinion on on top of his findings that uh, it is just it's it's really interesting. So we'll right. we'll go ahead and let that play. Paul Caluso, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Thank you for having me. Super excited to talk to you. Uh, so tell us, what, what was the motivation to write this paper? Um, I, you know, I, I think that there was, it, it, first off, it's a co-authored work, so that, that any motivation really came out of just conversation with my uh, two co-authors. But for me personally, and I think my contribution, the motivation was that a lot of my research is at the intersection of governance and investments, which kind of came out of my dissertation research as a PhD student. And I really thought this question was at the intersection of those two spaces, which we're really looking at. What, you know, what are different ways that an investor might get a short end of the stick at when they invest in a mutual fund um, with relation to complex instruments? And I I forget who it's attributed to. Maybe it was Larry Swedro said something along the lines that kind of hedge funds are investments to tell your friends about on the golf course more, more so than meeting your financial goals. And really, I think when we were thinking about complex instrument use at mutual funds, we were kind of thinking them as like hedge fund light um, strategies that investors could access and maybe kind of get some of that excitement um, or bra- you know brag golf course bragging ability that uh, a hedge fund would get. So I think just our prior was that this can't be good for investors. Uh, you never really know when you look at the data, and I would say. 80% of the ideas that we have as researchers that we think are great, somebody's already done it. So this is like a classic thing. You look on SSRN or Google Scholar, and it's like, yeah, that idea has been done. 
Um, and we this this happened with this paper that Amazon Brown Carlson and Chapman. I wrote a paper in 2004 that looked at a very similar question, but I think that it, it used a small sample. They found in their sample, not a small sample in terms of a limited number of years, that was kind of a quirky time period, which was kind of in the late 90s uh, stock market boom. And they found that there was kind of no relationship between complex instrument use or, or allowance really and mutual fund returns. And they basically made this compel. It's always nice, I would say, when a paper gets published that doesn't have results because there's a bias in the in the industry towards positive findings so that's always encouraging to see hmm. um but they basically had this governance equilibrium explanation where it was only the good governed funds that got access to them and the bad governed funds it was almost like handcuffs that the bad governed funds were placed on uh where they weren't given access but we were kind of like well maybe this is just time period specific what happens if we add and we wound up adding i think 15 years to their sample which included I think the very end of their sample started to have uh, when stocks declined around the dot-com bubble, but basically added the dot-com bubble, the financial crisis, which were obviously very stressed times for environments. And I think that we felt like that was a more representative sample. And of course, always out of sample evidence is good. Bigger sample is is good. So we, we put a lot of effort into expanding that and found results that aligned more with our priors than uh, the, the findings of Amazon et al. Huh, interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because that discussion in, in your paper is interesting. J just reading about the the small sample of the previous findings and how you tried to ex extend it. So I, I wasn't going to ask about that, but I'm glad you brought it up because that, that the whole discussion was was fascinating. Uh, can, can you talk about the types of complex instrument allowances that you look at in the paper? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I should preface this first, which there's more complex instruments that can be used besides just the ones that we looked at. And we were guided by one of the aims of this paper, and the journal is published in, uh, the aim of that journal is to sort of look at really well-published, really well-cited previous research. So we were sort of guided to use the same set of instruments that Amazon et al. use. So there's kind of different ways that you can categorize them at the kind of the more granular level. It was borrowing margin and short selling, which we then grouped into a category of leverage. Then there was options and futures, which we grouped into a category of derivatives. And then there's something called restricted securities, which is a bit esoteric, uh, but it's basically securities that aren't traded on public markets uh, that we kind of looked at it on its own. We thought that that last one was a little different than the, it's not necessarily complex, it's more liquid, but we wanted to again replicate uh, the previous study, but we also found that our results were robust if we didn't include that um, last category. And we have results that also look at them uh, those different categories individually. One other thing that's worth mentioning is that this was all in the equity space that kind of to, to specify a lot of, for example, uh, one of our performance measures is the alpha and a regression on the, not the cap M, but on the bomber French variables and, and momentum. And sort of that works a lot better in the equity space so that we kind of follow, again, following past literature focused on equity mutual funds. So there's definitely other funds that I would say layer on even more complexity by investing in markets that aren't limited to equities, but that that's outside the scope of the study that we did. Why did you focus on allowance as opposed to actual use? Uh, it, it was more of an, I would say mainly an empirical issue, which is the idea that as researchers, there's kind of a joke that the first comment you get in any presentation, especially as a, a governance researcher, is about endogeneity. And really the what we mean by that, and, and specific to this paper, is the idea of reverse causality. So the idea that it's not that uh, that use is you, complex instruments are causing bad performance, but it could be that bad performance is causing funds to use complex instruments. And there's real actually mm. kind of theoretical stories of why that could be the case. For example, there's this like tournament literature, which is that if you're behind, I mean, I, I like to think of the tournament literature as when you're watching American, I'm American, we have Canadian football now, I'm also Canadian now, but if a team's down at, at any point in the game, it's usually not a good idea just to throw a bomb for a touchdown, right? It gets intercepted probably a third of the time, batted down a third of the time and caught a third of the time, except for when you're down six points and there's no time left, right? So what mutual funds might do is if they're down because they get evaluated sort of at month end 
quarter end, year end, if they're down at the very end, they might use complex instruments to try to kind of throw that Hail Mary to, to get, mm. get returns. And if that's the case, you would see a spurious relationship between the use of complex instruments and negative returns because they tend to use the complex instruments in response to negative returns and not vice versa. Whereas with allowance, that's set sort of way ahead of time, you, you know, usually ahead of time, and it's not dynamically changing or not as much dynamically changing um, depending on performance. So I think that that's the main reason why we focus on allowance. But I think there's also issues, for example, with governance. If you're an investor, you have the, you actually indirectly set the fund bylaws as do you want them to use the allowance or not? Similar for, um, there's a similar sort of case to be made for regulators also doing that. And then we also have sort of this outstanding question, which we've seen a big increase in allowance in, in sort of past years. So we wanted to try to address what that increase in allowance hmm. might, you know, what what might be the causes and, you know, effects of that. And I think the last thing is that, again, one of the aims of this paper was to replicate that earlier paper by Amazon et al. And they also focused on allowance. Now, with kind of that whole spiel, I'll also say that we have tests that we just look at use. It doesn't seem like that effect of the it doesn't it didn't seem like they were throwing those Hail Marys with the in response to being down. And our results are kind of consistent whether we use use or allowance. Very, very interesting. You you mentioned that your your prior was uh, kind of that this maybe isn't so good for investors. Uh, c can you talk about the mechanisms that could potentially harm the investors in funds that are using complex instruments? Yeah. So I think right off the bat where that prior came out of, and I know that you guys had Burke and Van Binsberg on, and there was this argument. I think there was a discussion, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically this idea that the arithmetic of active management, which I think is William Sharp's uh, discussion, but Burke and Van Binsberg basically make an argument, well, if there's like naive retail investors, the average active manager can still have abnormal returns. So I would argue that in the complex instrument space, it's it's kind of becomes more and more difficult to find who is that na naive investor that you're able to trade against mm -hmm. and get alpha. And I think that when you look around sort of the poker table and think about who the sucker is, we think it's more likely that it's actually the mutual funds of the sucker and that they're maybe competing against really sophisticated managers, like for example, wow. hedge fund managers. Um, and my co-authors and I have another paper that they, and, and this fits into a literature that does show that hedge funds tend to be more sophisticated than it, at, at least um, mutual funds. So I think that's one aspect of it, but even assuming that there is no suckers, but that there's also no, so if there's no suckers, there's no retail investors that they're trading against, um, but there's also no hedge funds. There's just an issue of transaction costs and fees that's going to eat into, you know, assuming that Sharp's arithmetic is correct, that's going to eat into their overall returns and then make them the people that are allowed to use them and, and sometimes use them uh, do worse. So I think that's where some of the concern was. And then I think that there is, sort of other background ideas, like if they're using them for portfolio insurance reasons, we know that that's, that's something that um, can be expensive. We thought about uh, potential indirect effects. So this kind of gets at this idea. I, I remember hearing as a skier when people first started wearing helmets and seeing like a study in the New York Times that said the people who wore helmets actually got inj injured at higher rates than people who didn't wear helmets. And it's basically the idea that once you put on a helmet, you ski more recklessly. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether or not that's true, I think an open question, but mm -hmm. that if there could be these risk compensation effects that could also um, have, have impacts. And then I think the last thing, and this, this really gets out of wanting to expand the sample to periods like the financial crisis, uh, not just an, a full up, market, which is that maybe they're exposing themselves to risks, like you're selling deep out of the money puts, right? Mm -hmm. You could have in, you know, 99% of times, it looks like it's not harming you, but then it shows up, you sort of didn't realize the risk you're taking until after it shows up. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some of that going on as well. How did you evaluate the performance of funds? So I, I think that in the paper, kind of our 
what we, we call dependent variables are, we have some performance-based measures, and then we also sort of peel back the onion and ask about risk. With performance, we use three measures. One is just excess return, which would be the return of the fund minus the risk-free rate. I think it, I think it's the risk-free rate. It, that's, I, I just don't want to misspeak, but it would be worth checking the paper just to make sure that it's the risk free rate and not minus the market return. Um, the four factor alpha, which would be the return of the fund regressed against, basically it's the cap M plus a small effect, a value effect and a, mo a momentum factor. And then the last would be this MPPM measure, um, which is basically this, it's, it's a performance manipulation proof measure. And this gets at this idea that when you use, and I think this was discussed a little bit regarding covered calls, is that you can actually manipulate the risk that you're exposed to, to make it look like your four factor alpha is better or make it look like your sharp ratio is better than it actually is. And within, I think the way that I think about it, for example, with the sharp ratio is that if you can use complex instruments to transform some of your sharp, your standard deviation risk into skew risk or kurtosis risk, your overall level risk is still the same, but you've transformed what would be the denominator in the sharp ratio, which is the standard deviation, into other parts of risk that aren't actually in the sharp ratio calculation. So it artificially incre increase your sharp ratio. And this manipulation proof measure tries to get out of, excuse me, at that that concern. And we and we find a few places in our paper where it looks like, yeah, it it they're not doing bad on the four factor alpha, but the manipulation proof measure kind of uncovers the underperformance. Hmm. That, that, that is really interesting. I'm, I, I appreciated that explanation of the uh, MPPM. Uh, can, can you talk about how the usage of complex instruments evolved throughout the sample? Like did the usage increase, for example? Yeah, so this is interesting. And I, I don't think it, it, it was something that didn't align with our priors. So even though allowance actually increased dramatically, so we see that I think it was something like a three, a two, two and a half fold increase of the number of instruments. So if you take all of our very few funds are granted the ability to use margin and actually use margin. So if you take out margin, I think it was something like 26% of funds at the beginning of our sample were allowed to use the other five instruments. By the end of the sample, 60% were allowed to use it. Wow. That's allowed to use though. And, and this is, I think, what was a little counterintuitive to us. And we don't, I think it's left to future research of trying to pin down why um, the second result's the case. But we actually found that actual usage was somewhat flat despite the increase in allowance being so high. So hmm. we don't have a great explanation for why that, you know, why that might be. Uh, but the reality is, is that more and more mutual funds that people are investing in, they they might not even realize it, are allowed to use um, these complex instruments. And we basically show that even the allowance mm. without the use can have detrimental effects. Wow. What are the determinants of complex instrument allowance in the sample? So we, we basically look at things, factors related to monitoring quality and find that kind of consistent with the earlier paper by Al Mazan, that we do find that Funds that we perceive as being better monitored, so having better governance, do get more complex instrument allowance. So the two proxies that we use for governance quality would be the institutional ownership of the fund. So funds basically have institutional shares and retail shares. So we can look at the proportion of the fund that's owned by each of those two share classes. Mm. The second thing is the fund family size. So just a bigger fund family is going to have more resources uh, to and probably more controls to internally monitor. And we find that bigger fund families are more likely to grant um, allowance. Now, there could also be an addition to governance with fund family, just an economies of scale effect, where if you have, you know, you have the trading, you know, you have a complex instrument trading desk if you're a big uh, fund family. So that, that could be um, part, of the, part, of, part of the effect. We also find just independent of fund family size, just larger funds are more likely to have allowance. And then we also see that mm. younger funds um, and funds with worse fund flow, so less money going in, uh, are are more likely to have allowance. And I think that the younger fund effect might be a little bit because just if if you sort of came of age as a, if you were if your fund inception 
was more recently, that's when allowance was more the norm. So it might be that the older funds, if you were a fund that sort of is from the 80s, you would have had to change your bylaws, whereas it's easier when your bylaws are set maybe mm-hmm. to have that allowance. But we do find evidence also of even among funds with very old inception states that there is changes towards allowance over, over time. So it's not only driven by when their inception was, uh, which which we thought was interesting. Hmm. All right. So the, the, the big question, how, how is complex instrument allowance related to fund performance? Uh, very, very badly related to fund performance. So oh. I think that that's, I mean, I don't want to over overstate it and with the, with the very bad, you know, but we found that there was a negative and significant relation, which again, oh, is different from the Amazon findings and, you know, but aligns with our, uh, with sort of our hypotheses about these are all the potential costs. We don't see I mean, there could be the the case that they have lower returns, but less risk. And I think that's what we we try to address in in a a later part of the paper. But we find with respect to performance, they definitely underperform the funds. And we have a lot of controls to sort of try to compare like to like. So for a lot of our specifications, we're comparing funds that are are investing in the same style of of securities. And then once you also throw in that... um, or factor alpha, you're controlling for the type of securities that they're investing in. So funds that are small value funds or large growth funds or mid cap funds. So we're controlling for sort of as, as it's almost like a quasi match sample where we're, we're kind of fi- comparing funds with similar characteristics using our empirical approach. And we find that they underperform and sort of the magnitude of that underperformance is somewhere around you know, one to 2%, depending on on the measure that we use per year. And I I think one thing to keep in mind is that we made it sort of a very conscientious decision in our in our analysis, not to include, not to basically control for expense ratios and transaction costs, because we thought that those are mechanisms through which uh, there could be the drivers of the underperformance. So this is sort of net of those costs, not gross of, uh, of those costs. And similar to Ben's question, how is complex instrument allowance related to fund risk instead of performance? Yeah, so this was an area that we really weren't sure in which direction this was going to go because I think, and this also, uh, there's a big in the in the corporate finance literature, you know, in terms of firms' use of complex instruments. There's a big sort of debate, and we see both uses that sometimes they use them for hedging, and sometimes they use them for speculation. So we really, you know, didn't have strong priors in terms of what the effect on fund risk would be. Um, when we, you know, when we ran our our analysis, what we found was there were there was pretty substantial increases in fund risk. So we measured fund risk three ways. One is just standard deviation, which will capture capture sort of both systematic risk exposures and idiosyncratic risk exposures, and we see that with complex instrument allowance, the sort of total risk increased. And we actually saw that that was more driven by the systematic risk component. So we saw that the beta of the funds went up, whereas their idiosyncratic volatility wasn't significantly changed. And maybe, I mean, there there's different f- complex instruments. So for example, futures are usually on an entire index. So if funds using futures, I think it's not surprising, at least if they're long futures, if they're short, you'd expect a lower risk, but if they're long futures, you would see that sort of relationship with more beta exposure, but not necessarily uh, more idiosyncratic risk exposure. Hmm. How do the funds with more complex instruments uh, perform or or, uh, instrument allowance perform in up and down markets? Yeah, so this was one of the really sort of interesting things that we found, which was that we split up. So we, we, if you think about what our results were so far, we found worse performance and it was actually they're taking more risk. So when you put those two things together, we thought, well, if you're taking more risk, usually you perform better during up markets and worse during down markets. So what we did is we split our sample and we split it a lot of different ways, but we looked at in sort of the simplest split, just in that time period, was the market up or was it down? And what we found was, and and I should preface this with we're looking at six month periods in, in our sample over a six month period, there was about twice as many up markets as there was down markets. So even if you do, even if you do less, you know, ideally 
if you're doing well, you do better in up markets than you do in down markets. And in that you do, you know, overall better. But even if it was like a 50-50 split, since there's more up markets, you would still outperform. But what we find is actually when the funds use allowance, kind of the magnitude of their underperformance in down markets is about three times larger than the magnitude of their performance in up markets. Mm -hmm. um, so that when you group those together, the performance in the up markets isn't enough to compensate them for the performance in the down markets. And I think whenever you see a result like that, I think I, I think in almost every one of the papers I've ever written, they they we've made sure that even if we take out the financial crisis, which was kind of an anomalous period, um, that not to say that it can't repeat, but when you only have a 15 year sample, it probably isn't, that's probably like a one out of 50 year event, not a one out of 15 year event. So you want to make sure that your results are are not sensitive uh, just to that time period. So we took out the financial crisis from our sample and basically found the same asymmetry in the up and uh, down market uh, where they just get really crushed in down markets, which is not compensated for the returns in up markets. And I think that just, I think that raises questions when you asked earlier about what could be, you know, what are you thinking about? Why might the funds that use these underperform or, or overperform? And one of the things we talked about was just exposing yourself to left tail risk that you sort of didn't really realize. Mm. And it seems like, uh, you know, this result is consistent with that left tail risk exposure. Hmm. Interesting. Is that similar to what we talked about for covered calls where you're, where you're keeping the, the, the left tail, but you're kind of cutting off your right tail? Yeah. As a matter of fact, it is. That's a you know that's not something we explicitly. I, I don't think we explicitly mentioned in the paper, but that definitely is a pattern, right? That asymmetry is is almost exactly what you'd observe for covered calls. I think the one thing that isn't in that in our result is you'd expect with covered calls, your me I would expect your median performance to increase if that makes sense because you're collecting a premium, uh, but you basically don't have the upside, but you're getting smoked on the downside. So. Uh, you know, th th I think this is, and that's, that's not necessarily the most smoked isn't the most technical finance term, but, uh, <laughs> there, there are definitely, there's definitely an asymmetry in the return pattern that we see, which would be consistent with what we also observe, uh, with the, with covered calls. We have analysis that looks at the individual instruments, but not in up and down markets, I think that would be a really interesting area for future research is of the instruments that are in our sample is options instruments where you'd see those cover call strategies most sensitive uh, to that asymmetry in the up and down markets. Mm. Um, so we, we we referenced this paper um, it, when we did cover calls. That's, that's kind of how we ended up here. Uh, and you guys, you did group, uh, I think, option selling income related strategies specifically in your paper. H how did they perform in your sample? Yeah, so I'll preface this with that. This analysis was in a in a subsample because of data availability was just whereas the rest of our samples covering a really long time period or not. I shouldn't say really long. There's some papers that cover 1927 or even 1800 to present. It covers a longer time period than uh, the uh, Amazon et al. paper, but we only had data on individual option use from, I think, 2009 through the end of our sample in 2015. So mm -hmm. it's a smaller sample that was that's also um, sensitive to some matching issues. So it's really a subsample, but within this subsample, we do find results that are consistent with the rest of our results, which is always a good sign. It's kind of like a bit of an out of sample uh, test. And then we also find results that are consistent sort of with the underperformance of covered calls. So we split basically option strategies into three subgroups, which is would be one would be hedge strategies, which would kind of be like owning a stock and buying a put. One would be an unhedge strategy, which would be like buying a put or call without owning the stock. And then the third would be something like a covered call, which is, you know, buying the stock and selling the call, right? And what we find is that cover calls kind of consistent with, you know, what's been discussed is covered calls underperform. And what's really interesting, and this kind of validates our use of the MPP measure, is that we don't see the underperformance in the four factor alpha. We only see it in the MPPM measure. Hmm. So that there is kind of, we interpret that as evidence of if you're looking at the wrong measure of performance, it might look like this isn't so bad. 
But once you properly adjust for the risk that you're being exposed for, it isn't benefiting the investor. Um, I, again, I would just preface that with it is a shorter sample. So the sa same concerns we had about Amazon at Al's paper only being a six year sample, you could also argue that those concerns relate to that. So maybe in years in the future, there will be a replication of, of this table or in a future research in this table. And that's actually one thing that my co-authors and I are excited about is I think in 2019, uh, the SEC created new, new regulation to better disclose the complex instrument positions of funds. So that's something that we're looking at of what else can we study uh, in this space using that new the new form that, that mutual funds are required to fill out. But I think one other interesting thing about sort of that analysis that we did was that the unhedged strategies, so just kind of the speculative positions were actually the least detrimental to to the investors. We sort of didn't see outperformance, but we didn't see underperformance mm -hmm. there. So, I mean, this is only specific to option strategies, not the broader use of all complex instruments, but the most negative performance was on the covered, you know, income strategies, which covered calls would be part of, and then the hedge strategies, which would be consistent with, um, consistent with uh, just portfolio insurance being expensive. Um, so that sort of that makes sense. And one other interesting thing that we saw is that when they actually use these, again, specific to the option strategies, they're actually lowering their standard deviations of, of their, their their total risks. So both when we think about, really, we see it across the board. We see that they have lower total standard deviation of the fund returns, lower beta exposure. And at least for the hedge strategies, we see lower idiosyncratic risk too, which makes sense if they're hedging, right? That you're, you're cutting away some of the idiosyncratic volatility. So, Paul, what do you think is the main takeaway for investors hoping to get superior performance from funds employing these complex products? Uh, you know, I, I think the, the the main piece is, you know, buyer beware that if at least, you know, over our sample period, and, and uh, we've also extended our analysis to go back to basically when this information is first available. So we have analysis in the paper that also includes Amazon sample period, which we don't include in our main analysis because of uh, just issues issues with the data um, that far back. But we see that there is a negative relationship between these complex instruments and performance, which is not good for investors. And then there's also a very negative relationship in really bad market periods. And we know that you know, that's when it hurts the most, right? Ideally, we want portfolios that hedge hedge those market period, those really bad market periods. And if it's strategies giving us really negative returns in the worst times, that should be a strategy that outperforms uh, because you want to be compensated for that risk. And we actually find the opposite for that. So I think that the main takeaway is sort of being cautious don't go into invest in these lightly. And I think just as a general advice, given the results of the paper, if you know, if it was a, a lot of times as a finance, I'm sure that this happens with your social networks as well, but people just ask for casual investment advice. My usual investment advice is index funds, uh, certainly not these complex instruments. So if my father, who I love dearly, came to me and said, hey, Paul, you know, check out this new fund I'm investing in. And it's one of these funds I would I would try to get my brothers and I to talk them out of it, right? But I do think that I, there was recently, DFA came out with a paper that looked at liquid alternatives that in many ways was similar to our paper showing the underperformance of liquid alternatives um, over, I don't know if it was a 20 year sample. And what I think they looked at was market neutral strategies, long short strategies and managed future strategies. So that'd be a subsample of the type of funds that we're looking at. And they basically showed very similar results to us that they underperformed, you know, I want to say like the stock market, uh, 60, 40 type portfolio over the past 20 years. And Cliff Asnes, who I have tremendous respect for him and, and the, uh, both the researchers and practitioners at AQR basically took offense to the paper because they run a lot of those strategies and they basically said something along the lines. And of course I'm paraphrasing here, but just because 
I, and I think this applies to our paper too. Just because on average the effect was bad doesn't mean that there could also be some good players there. And our paper doesn't really address are there ways beforehand to predict who the good players might be. And I don't even know, I don't know for sure that that's possible, but I think there could still be the possibility that maybe there's funds that have low fees or have a good track record of keeping transaction costs down or have a very you know, systematic strategy that takes out emotion, uh, maybe those strategies won't underperform and just give investors, just like an index fund, give investors access to just passive risk exposures. So I, I think that's just the one caveat to our finding that that I would put down that I don't I don't think it it should be necessarily a criticism of the entire industry and there could still be good and bad apples in the industry. Interesting. But maybe not as straightforward as the advice to buy index funds. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely the uh, <laughs> that's definitely the, and I think that that's uh, there's a long line of academics, some of the great ones that have appeared on your podcast that would give that same advice. That I think yep. getting passive, low cost exposure to you know diversified exposure to markets is going to be your best bet for the long term, and especially I think a really important aspect of of investing is being able to stick to your strategies. And it's, yep. I mean, when you're investing in black boxes, it's going to be really hard to uh, to stick to those strategies. Hmm. So I, I got to ask, like, you've got these findings, you mentioned DFA had a paper with, with similar findings. Why do you think that we're seeing complex products grow when they don't seem to be performing that well? Yeah. I I mean, I, I think the the hopeful academic would say, and me would say that, and I have a paper that shows that after publication of academic research, market participants change their behavior. So this is in the context of investing wow. in, in uh, stock market anomalies. But I would argue that one contribution of our paper is that there was this paper that was very well cited from 2004 that said complex instruments aren't necessarily bad, especially if, it, if the use is at well-governed firms. Um, and I would say that, well, now we have new evidence and maybe mm. this new evidence will change investors' priors. Um, like this, the CFA covered our paper, uh, like the CFA Digest, I want to say, covered our paper. I think that um, a public you know, a forum like our this podcast will also sort of get the word out to investors and I think could potentially lead to less allowance or less fund flows going to those uh, funds that grant allowance. So the, the other paper that you're talking about, I think uh, that, that paper is fascinating also. Um, but wasn't it the, the hedge funds that were most responsive to the research in that paper? It was. It was. So I, I guess the the counter to that would be that maybe retail and that, well, I, I, I would say this is maybe the academic channel isn't the best way for retail investors to hear, you know, ap academic publication. But there's other ways to disseminate information. I think the podcasts uh, geared towards retail investors is one way to disseminate that information. So, um, hmm. may, you know, I, I think another thing is that would be interesting area of future research is we see an increase in allowance, but we don't see an increase in use. So the proportion, hmm. I, I guess one question that a lot of papers look at, and I think that it would be interesting in this paper is to what extent has allowance has the impact of allowance on fund returns varied over time. So may, you know, maybe, maybe as there's been more allowance granted, but not a, a concurrent increase in use, maybe it's been that less people that have been allowed to use it have actually been using it. So that kind of at a per fund basis, there's, there's more funds that aren't, that aren't, are insulated maybe a bit from from our results, but I think the the concern is always if you sort of if you have that temptation of being able to use it, maybe when there's there could be spill you know there could be sort of spillover spillover effects or indirect effects that could still cause harm. So, um, hmm. interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I, say I, also just that the SEC creating this greater disclosure should also bring attention to it. So it's not something that mm. like the SEC is oblivious to that in 2019, they completely revamped the disclosure requirements of, of uh, funds using 
complex instruments. So that could also maybe shine a spotlight on it. I think that generally, again, this is, there's nuance to almost every result in, in finance, but generally more transparency is a good thing. So shining a spotlight on it, bringing transparency to the use of these instruments maybe also improves uh, things. So I think that that's another audience for these sorts of research. Like we always think about other academics. I mean, ultimately we want to, our research to have impacts on the marketplace. And one way to do that's by encouraging other researchers to look through it. One way to do that is by encouraging market participants, but also uh, through the regulatory channel. So I think that uh, this research can help, you know, guide regulators when they, uh, you know, as, as they're forming their rules around the complex instrument use and allowance. Hmm. Awesome. That, that, that was that was super interesting. It's a really interesting paper, and I think you did a, a really nice job explaining it. Thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast, Paul. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Paul. All right, so I, as promised, that was a fantastic conversation with uh, with Professor Paul Caluso, who, uh, who knows, maybe we'll have him back on in the future to, to discuss some of the other research. Oh, I think he'd love to come back on. be great to yeah. have him on. I yeah. love relationships like that. so much fun. Yeah. All right. Well, before we get to our conversation with Sean, let's do a quick recap of a past episode for people who are more recent listeners and haven't gone back through time. We just try to highlight past episodes that might be of interest to you. So this one features Rob Carrick, who was our guest on episode 39 back in 2019. Rob's been writing about Canadian personal finance for over 30 years, and we discussed a whole wide range of topics. What is really cool about Rob is that his incredible feedback loop from his many Canadian followers on all sorts of financial topics. His most important observation is that he thinks people have too much information and need help distilling it all. His career started in the mutual fund days of the 90s and has seen a huge shift to ETFs, which is one of the most talked about topics from his readers. In fact, he said he could write about them constantly. He agreed with us that trashing mutual funds is unwarranted as it became an equivalency for active management. He now talks about changing from being an advice skeptic to an advice booster. Near the end, we got his advice on teaching kids about money and instilling good habits. This then led to his thoughts on the FIRE movement. So check out the whole episode with Rob Carrick, episode 39. All right, let's go to book review of the week, which leads to our movie review of the week. I think it's our first movie review, right, Ben? That's part of the formal section. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, this is a book that you and I have had on our bookshelf since it was written back in 2015. I think we both saw a presentation back then from Sean. We Mm -hmm. both read the book called Losing the Signal, The Spectacular Rise and Fall of Blackberry. Um, Many listeners for sure had that incredible rush. I remember it. It's funny. I took a train to Toronto this week, which we can talk about later. Uh, But I remember being on the train going to Montreal with my Blackberry. I remember unpacking the box on the train. And all of a sudden it started working. I was just blown away that you could get email on this little device. It was an unreal experience. It was just such a rush to not have to be at your desk. And the power of that was just incredible. It was mind blowing. And you could see how successful whoever came up with that idea could be in growing a business. And that's exactly what happened with BlackBerry. Everybody had to have this, this tool at the time. And then you could sync it with your calendar and your contacts it was simply incredible. You know, I remember when 9-11 happened and the BlackBerry worked. I remember when Obama was elected and, and he, he was, uh, I think the article talked about, or the, at the time he was arguably addicted to the BlackBerry. It could never let it go. And I remember talk radio here in town. They used to have a market, some uh, stock market show, and they talked about BlackBerry. It seemed like every week as I listened to the show, like it was the hot stock in Canada, perhaps you know worldwide. Um, everyone had done it. Everyone talked about it. It was an unreal time until it wasn't. The whole thing just blew up in unbelievably spectacular fashion. And that's the story in this incredible book called Losing the Signal, um, which is written by Sean Silkoff and Jackie McNish. Again, it was released in 2015. It's just a fascinating story of how these two guys, you know, Mike Lazaridis, Lazaridis and Jim Balsilli came together um, to create and market and go to market with this unreal idea and product. And then how it all fell apart, you know, caused by competition, you know, the likes of Apple to, to wireless carriers, the impact, the app store impact. It's just a wild, wild story about this company. 
So we invited Sean to talk about, you know, this whole time, his book, and then also about the movie, which comes out on May 12th. Sean writes about technology and innovation for the Globe and Mail and has won three national newspaper awards. So with that, let's go to our conversation with Sean Silka. Sean Silkoff, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Thanks for having me, Karen. Congratulations uh, on your book and then on the movie that's coming up very shortly. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of surreal. Uh, it must be. I reread the book last week, uh, as I mentioned to you, and, and loved it the first time and loved it the second time, and so looking forward to the movie. So first, let's kick it off. How revolutionary was the BlackBerry phone? So for a very long time before the BlackBerry came along, people were trying to figure out how to send data <clears throat> wirelessly. It had been talked about for, for many years. I mean, the first email was sent wirelessly in the early 70s, believe it or not, at uh, University of Hawaii, allowing uh, students and professors to communicate between the different campuses. And so this had been something on on people's minds for a while. We had the advent of cell phones. They became commercialized in the 80s, 90s. Um, and yet no one could really figure out how to uh, how to transmit data uh, effectively to wireless devices, or even what the market use of that would be. Like there were wireless data networks, and they were kind of empty in the 90s. I mean, it was mostly geared toward you know like IBM or Rogers uh, deliver delivery trucks, so they communicate to them while they were on the road. And what passed as a wireless device was something probably about the size of a TV that would be bolted into, into a delivery truck so that you could communicate with the driver. And then, you know, the idea was better customer service. You could tell the customers, well, your delivery or your, your um, uh, you know, your, your repair person will be there on site between nine and 10 or as opposed to, you know, one and eight, right? And so you had these vast empty networks. You didn't have great applications. There wasn't much of a user base. And then along comes email in 1995, and suddenly we're all using email, and we're inundated by email. It's everywhere. And people at BlackBerry were working, uh, the company Research in Motion, as it was called at the time, was working on things like modem cards and software and, you know, what you would consider the kind of the on and off ramp and uh, utilities of this otherwise uh, empty uh, data network. Uh, it was called Mobitex. And they got the idea that they wanted to put devices on this network. And then with email suddenly inundating everyone, the idea had them, why don't we create a device that can send and receive wireless email? And so they came up with this, this device. It was the right device at the right time for the right purpose. Suddenly people had, you know, at the end of the day, if you were a traveling salesperson, you'd come back to your hotel, right? You'd log in. <laughs> dial up dial up log in that would take yep. like 15 minutes remember remember how painful that was yep. and then suddenly this torrent of email would come firing at you at nine o'clock you're tired you've been collecting business cards and delivering pitches all day and now you have to respond to 150 emails and um the great thing about the blackberry is it enabled you to communicate for the first time ever and you have to remember this is like the creation of fire in the mobile communication space um you could suddenly uh, respond to your emails when you're you know, in a taxi, in a lineup at the airport, uh, during a boring meeting. And the idea, and they, they pitched it the right way too, as, a, as an efficiency tool. And they really engineered the device to be super easy, and not only really easy, but fun to use. Michael Azaridis, the science co-CEO of the company, talked about uh, removing think points. And that meant like make the device as easy to use, simple as to use, so you don't have to think when you're using it. It just yep. works. It works in the way you expect it to work and the way that you would want it to work. And their goal is to engineer something, an experience so ideal that if you were sitting in front of your computer, you would prefer to type on the device than actually on your computer. And it worked. And then they got it into the hands of the right people. Um, they seeded it very early on with Wall Street advisors, lawyers, and investment bankers. Well, when the Fortune 500 CEOs saw that, they're like, what is that thing? I want one too. And when the CEO suddenly, and like anyone in the early days had wireless email, it's like the light went on. Wow, I can respond to emails right away. And if you're a CEO or an advisor, you want people to respond back to you like in six seconds. 
And people weren't used to that. Back when we were all starting to use email, you might get to your email one or two days later. There was no real urgency. The BlackBerry brought urgency to email. And because it was going to people in the hands of people who needed information to make decisions right away, um, it spread like a virus. Because if you were CEO, you wanted all your direct reports to have a BlackBerry, if you had one. And then they needed one so that all their direct reports could get the information uh, as soon as possible. So it spread like a virus that way. And, you know, they employed a lot of fun, devious, sometimes interesting creative tactics, which, which of course we go into in the books, in, in the book, to um, make sure it got out to the right people, to make sure that the chief information officers uh, had no choice but to install the BlackBerry uh, enterprise server uh, in the heart of their operations. Um, so it began to spread that way. 9-11 happens. Um, and communications are down in Manhattan and in Washington. The only people who can communicate um, on devices at that in that traumatic time are people with Blackberry. So one of the first things that happens after um, everything gets back to normal is everyone in the House of Representatives gets Blackberry. So very quickly it became adopted um, and sanctioned as the, the device of choice for very powerful people. Um, so, and then they made a big push into consumer they made the devices a little sexier. They added color, music. They, you know, they made them fun to use. They made them thinner so they looked more like phones. They added phone service. I mean, you couldn't even make a call on a BlackBerry for the first three years. Right. It was only when they moved from the wireless networks to the main telco networks that they actually had to add voice. And the first voice uh, thing that it was like a plug-in, you know, you had to plug it into the phone and stick it in your ear. It was it was very ungainly at first. So they kind of backed into the smartphone phone part of that business. Okay, so so you you mentioned the right product at the right time. You mentioned the the nine eleven story, which is a uh, I mean, uh, funny to call that luck, but it was a an event that pushed the the device out to a lot of people uh, based on necessity. Um, how, how important, so that, that's kind of like a product market fit, I guess. How important was the company's leadership as opposed to that just having the right product to its success? Well, the leadership was important because they, early on, they realized that the right thing to do was to do something economical and small. Hmm. And that didn't use a lot of battery power, that didn't use a lot of the um, uh, bandwidth of the network. And they beat back all of Silicon Valley's best and brightest that were trying to stick computers into machines, uh, into handheld machines. And that worked. And uh, they became the wireless email standard, wireless device standard by, by just really using it for messaging. And you had other add-ons like calendar, but the main thing to use this for was messaging. And so they really sold this as a messaging device. And that was the payload. That was, that was the killer app and it worked. And so for years, they made very smart management decisions to not do a computer and a phone, and that worked. Others failed uh, in, in their attempts to do that. And also to uh, maintain their leadership and messaging, first with email, and then, of course, with BBM, which was the forerunner of WhatsApp um, and Signal and other popular uh, instant uh, wireless messaging uh, apps. So they were doing all the right things. They were making the devices easier to use, more accessible, making all the right choices. But... Um, the key decision that they didn't make well was when the Apple came on the scene. So BlackBerry were great innovators and they were terrible followers. And the reaction to seeing the Apple was first off, well, this is a computer and a phone. We've seen this movie before. Uh, it doesn't end well. Um, it's going to suck up um, battery life. The batteries are gonna, you're not, your battery is going to last a few hours and that's it. It's going to hog the network because you're putting through a lot of data because Remember, Blackberries were built to do email and messaging, and Apple was about browsing the internet. That was a data-heavy endeavor. And uh, it's not very secure, and typing on glass kind of sucks. So that was Blackberry's reaction. So they didn't think they like they needed to have a reaction uh, at first. Uh, whereas Google, which was planning a keyboard phone like BlackBerry, took one look at the iPhone when they saw it in early 2007 when it was announced, and they tore up their plans <laughs> for a keyboard phone and said, okay, we have to go all in on touchscreen. And that's what led to the Android uh, operating system. So hmm. BlackBerry uh, were great innovators, terrible followers. Um, when Verizon, which didn't get the Apple for the first few years, wanted an uh, iPhone killer, BlackBerry said, we can do it. It was a big contract for BlackBerry. 
And what they thought it t- would work as a touchscreen was basically a BlackBerry in touchscreen form. So it didn't have the rich software of uh, the iPhone. It didn't have the capacity uh, for an app store. Now, there wasn't an app store yet for, for Apple. That came a year later. And they thought they could just take the existing operating system, which was perfectly suited to messaging, and stick it in a new type of device that was a touchscreen. But their version of a touchscreen was a physical screen. The entire screen floated on top of the device. It was called the Storm. And you'd have to like push down on the screen and the entire thing would go down. It would be right. like you were pressing a giant button. It would make a, a clicking sound. And they thought that would work. Uh, and the problem was they had too too few months to put this together. It was a brand new type of machine for them. They had to re, redo the software. There's a lot that could go wrong and a lot did go wrong. Uh, the devices were buggy and they were clunky. Like people, once they worked on a touch screen, you know, with this nice screen that you would do that with. That was the new paradigm. And this this was not that like it was like they were dealing with old dead technology. You know, mm-hmm. it, it felt mechanical. And also it wasn't delivering the kind of experience that Apple was delivering in terms of that full internet experience. So the storm was a disaster. Uh Verizon sent back the first million devices that they got from BlackBerry because they were buggy and people didn't like them. And what did BlackBerry do at this point? Uh, big key management decision. They didn't say we have to now go all in on a touchscreen. First, they tried to do they tried to perfect the problems in Storm. So perfect the flawed pro, uh, product with the Storm Two. And they were even working on the Storm Three when the telco said, "Hey guys, like, can it with this fake touchscreen? Give us a real touchscreen." So then they figured the problem was they needed to get a browser. So they bought a browser company, and. Things ran slow. So finally they realized, okay, we need to build a full touchscreen device from the beginning. And they encountered some indecision about what to do, how to do that. So the time they came up with the BB10, which was their full touchscreen, complete, you know, competitor to Apple and Android, it was six years later. And in tech, six years is forever. You don't have six years to come up with a competitive response. And the App Store was also really destabilizing for them. Because, um, you know, in a world before Apple came along, the carriers ruled everything, you know, and they, BlackBerry was fine with that. You know, the black, they didn't even want you to have an app store. Like the carriers were very controlling. And that's the way the world seemed to be for BlackBerry. You know, these were the gods of the business. They Suddenly Apple comes along and AT&T gives them carte blanche to come and, you know, go on their network with all this extra data, crash the network. And then a year later, they let them open up an app store. Well, in the old world before Apple, Nokia tried to do an app store and they were punished for that. BlackBerry, to get BBM out to the phones, they had to do it around the backs of the carriers and sneak it into a software update. Like that's how you got, or or browsers, you know, you had to sneak it onto the network. And, you know, that's that's the 2004 and 2005 reality. By 2008, 2009, the telcos are going, yeah, you want an app store? Sure. And remember, remember that Google and Apple had spent years uh, developing, um, you know, very robust software, great ecosystem. They had a lot of developers. So they had a ready-made set of developers ready to walk in on day one and develop great apps. BlackBerry didn't have that because mm. they never had to have an app store because their operating system was perfectly fine for the realities of the telcos. So the telcos blinking and giving Apple carte blanche really pulled out the rug from under BlackBerry wow. in an unexpected way. And I'll tell you, so, so I'm just trying to answer your question by pointing out that they needed to act very quickly, but they were also dealt um, a, a, a tough hand. And it's hard to imagine in some ways how they might have overcome that. Here's the most, one of the most challenging uh, disruptions to BlackBerry. So when uh, Android came out with this device, Verizon, uh, which had been very tough on app stores just three, four years earlier, said, yep, you can have an app store. So boom, they have an instant app store. And then what Android does is very sneaky. Their 30% cut of app sales they gave that to the carriers. Hmm. They didn't need it. They wanted. They just wanted to get search and other Google services onto every phone, right? So it's basically saying to the carriers, here, you sell our devices, here's some free money. What would you like to do with this free money? So what do you think the carriers did? They stopped selling BlackBerry and they started pushing <laughs> Android devices. Wow. And then on top of all this, um, BlackBerry for years had been ordered on mass by um, corporations for their staff, issued to their staff. After the 2008-2009 recession, companies are looking to cut money, uh, it cut costs. So they say to people, you know what, the devices you use at home, you can bring them in and we'll just, you know, we'll add them to the network. Bring your own device was devastating for BlackBerry because 
on on the weekends and at nights, people weren't using Blackberries for fun. They were using Apples and Android. So right. all these things add up. And it's really, really hard for management to deal with that. So you could argue that like the moment the iPhone appeared, um, BlackBerry had to do everything right and they had to do it fast. They did everything wrong and they took two. So, um, and then you also, you know, another part of your, another answer to your question is you had two CEOs, two co-CEOs. You had the business leader, Jim Balsley, and you had the technical leader, Mike Lazaridis. And the the idea was Mike was left to run the business, the um, engineering science side of the business. Jim was left to run the business part of the business. They trusted each other. That was great. That worked. That kind of arrangement works really well. It doesn't until it doesn't work at all. Uh, we saw a couple of tension points um, in that Jim, because he wasn't a technical person, you know, trusted Mike and and maybe didn't lend as much of a um, a critical voice to some of the technical decisions that were being made at, at critical times. And then Jim on the business side, uh, they were doing a lot of uh, stock options backdating. And you, you know, you might recall in the early 2000s, 1999 era, stocks were extremely volatile for tech companies. Like your stock could be worth $30 one day and hundred the next day, and then 40 the day after. If you're issuing stock options to bring on employees, how the heck are you supposed to value that when one day you're making a millionaire and the next day you're making a pauper? You know, you want to retain all these people. So what BlackBerry would do, which a lot of tech companies were doing at the time, was they were backdating options, picking a date in the past after the date someone hired and picking the right stock price to sort of basically maximize the gains that they could get. Well, that worked fine for years until the Securities and Exchange Commission came along. <laughs> and because BlackBerry was an email company and because there were all these, um, and because there was all this, frankly, you know, a record back and forth about all the conversations internally about who would get a, a options grant. So they were kind of made the poster child of this problem and they got penalized. And during the very um, harrowing meetings with SEC, with regulators, Mike Lazaridis was like, didn't know what this was. His signature was there, but he trusted all this to Jim. And uh, he didn't want to go to jail. He didn't want to lose his company. So he cut a deal for more lenient treatment with the regulators. And Jim felt betrayed by that because he felt like these two had led the business shoulder to shoulder for years. Jim had helped um, deal with some of Mike's mistakes. And now Mike was sort of throwing him under the bus. So that kind of that kind of ruined their relationship in at, at the worst possible time as everything is starting to come off with Apple. Uh, unreal that 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 part of the book of of all of that of their response to Apple and all all the little details in there. Like I think that there's there, there's one quote I don't remember it um, verbatim, but from from Jim about being asked about the iPhone and he kind of brushes it off, saying oh, I haven't seen one or something like that. But that that whole that whole part of the book is just like oh, it's it's almost hard to read, but it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, they, well, they were you know they were Jim Jim was Jim was always selling. He was selling what he had. And he was always a, a, a loyal soldier to the company. So, you know, even when he was uh, saying things like that, I think he was, it, it was mostly bravado, but internally he was struggling. He had what he called the strategic uh, confusion. He didn't know how to handle all these issues. Like how do you build an app store when you're not built, built to build an app store? How do you, you yeah. know, do, do you, do you start over with software? There was, there was a lot going on and the, the answers weren't obvious. No. How impactful were the company's internal struggles to the decline? Pretty significant. Um, now you have to remember this was a hardware company and not a software company, and they were their sales at points were going up twenty five percent quarter to quarter. And it's easy enough with software to scale up, but when you're you stamping out metal and plastic, and you need to increase your um, capacity, you're yeah. trying to secure manufacturing around the world. And they ran into some serious safety, uh, they, sorry, they ran into some serious quality issues. Um, you know, things were falling off the machines, they weren't working well. And this was also happening at the time. And I think that helped to kind of create uh, a part of the schism. I mean, Jim and Mike not getting along was a big part, but then you had the sales organization and the um, and the machine building part of the organi organization that also weren't getting along because they were pointing fingers at each other. And, mm -hmm. The problems weren't really getting solved. Um, they also had a, a COO, a tough guy named Larry Conley. He'd come from Motorola, very tough performance culture uh, when he was growing up there. 
And he really made the trains run on time at BlackBerry. And he got everything in line. He got production schedules. He built forecasts, all the kinds of things that were lacking at BlackBerry. He left in 2009, like just the worst time for the company. And so things got a little lax and, and a little off the rails when, once he left. Hmm. What, what effect do you think Canada's so-called tall poppy syndrome had on the company? I don't think it had much impact at all, uh, really. I think, I think the one thing, actually, is that they were very proudly based in Waterloo. Like mm-hmm. when a big company from New York or LA or San Francisco would call up Waterloo, call up Jim and say, oh, you know, we'd love to meet with you. Jim would say, great. Why don't you get up to Waterloo? The next, you know, come on the next plane. Like we're not going to leave little Waterloo to come to the big city. If you mm-hmm. want us, you come to us. And I think, you know, growing up in Waterloo, like they, they became very successful, but they lacked a bit of the Silicon Valley creative destruction element in their DNA, I think. And I think it would have helped BlackBerry RIM, Research in Motion, to have an office and have some serious brain trust in uh, Silicon Valley that was a bit more tuned in with the trends that could bring a bit more of that um, terror, you know, the terror of being overtaken and overwhelmed back to Waterloo. I think the fact that they did this, that they created the wireless communications business and they did it from Canada was an enormous point of pride. And I think a certain sense of sense of self-satisfaction probably crept in, particularly on the engineering side, on Mike's side. And I think, I think they were always looking over their shoulders, but, um, you know, the only the paranoid survive line that's, you know, famous. Uh, I, I think they needed a little bit more of that. And I think, I think that was part of it, but it's hard. Like, what do you do when the iPhone comes along? And it's, it looks a lot like the types of devices you were seeing seven or eight years earlier that you had defeated. Who's to know this isn't just another one that's heading exactly. to the crash shape. I mean, a lot of tech companies, big ones, have had failed products. Google has had tons of them. Yep. So maybe this is just going to be another one. And they felt, well, we kind of nailed messaging. You know, people love messaging and it's great. Uh, what they didn't anticipate is that people would fall in love with the uh, internet in your palm as much as they did. And didn't foresee how much of the economy would be created and moved on to our handheld devices. I and mean, it's extraordinary now if you think about it, right? Like we order Ubers, we order all our food online, whole giant multi tens of billions of dollar valued businesses were created based on the thing you hold in your hand now. Yep. That were not possible 10 or 15 years ago. We do so much on these devices. And that just was not something that BlackBerry could have anticipated but that Apple did. I mean, a lot was happening on library devices, don't get me wrong, but um, but Steve Jobs could see this was where the puck was going. And he said that, which was kind of a clever dig at research in motion when he introduced this, you know, to, mm. to pull out a Wayne Gretzky quote with the, the Canadian smartphone company up there prominently featured on his slides uh, at, at the big, uh, big uh, release in uh, January, 2007. So what do you think makes this story so compelling to be told in a movie? Oh, well, there's where do you start? First of all, it's a rise and a fall. Uh, it's about an innovator. Uh, this is at a time, remember, where we are seeing a lot of business narratives reaching the screen, uh, uh, the big screen and the small screen, screen social network. You know, the, the founder about Ray Kroc from McDonald's. You've got the Theranos story um, from the Bad Blood book. Uh, even the Tetris movie. This is an era where we are appreciating the character of the entrepreneur, you know, the tech entrepreneur. This this is a great, a great and significant character in 21st century world we live in. I'm surprised we don't have an Elon Musk movie yet, but I'm sure we will. People are really drawn to and intrigued by these characters and their flaws, the companies they build, the people that they are. And there's a lot of drama here. I mean, this story has lots of, classic dramatic elements in it and remember it's a rise and a fall that's a classic narrative arc it's about two people who are who couldn't be more different who come together and then break apart um uh, over an issue that we first brought to light in our in our book losing the signal and it's about a technology that changed the world 
It really, it changed the way we live. So that's like, those are extraordinary elements. And, you know, in the hands of these filmmakers, they've turned into a really intriguing movie. It's fast, it's fun, it's uh, it's edgy. It sort of takes you into the pit of innovation and kind of what it takes to build a, a company and some of the sacrifices that are made along the way. Uh, the fact that it's not just one person, but two people and the, and the tensions that that relationship uh, creates um, and also how hard it is to keep up with the drumbeat of, uh, of uh, disruptive uh, destabilizing innovation. And it's really, it's really well rendered. Um, it's obviously different than the book. You know, we had 250 pages to, to tell a definitive story for the first time, really, because people did not know the Blackberry story at all. And they have two hours to keep you in your seats, entertained, munching on popcorn. And I think we we each did uh, with our book and their movie. Um, you know, I think we each did uh, a, a great job. And the great thing about an adaptation is, you know, a typical adaptation, and this is no different. You know, they'll play around with dates, they'll play around with names, they'll create composite characters, they'll move some facts around. And in fact, the filmmakers even very interesting say this is a fictionalization. Um, which just gives them a, a bit more creative license to tell the story they want. Um, although, you know, it's very faithful to the to a lot of the key narrative elements that defined uh, the story up to the, you know, up to the the beginning of the of the painful fall. And so, um, you know, I liken it to Sound of Music or Hamilton. You know, I don't know if you've seen the show Hamilton, but it's about the life of Alexander Hamilton. It's one of the best musicals ever made. It's based on a book that's like this big which is probably one of the best historical biographies ever written about anyone or an American, certainly an American um, founding father. You know, the musical uh, is, it's, you know, the musical is not a definitive history, but the book is a terrible musical, right? <laughs> you, you read that book and you're like, how could anyone make a, mu a musical out of this? And so it's interesting. It's, it's a real artistic process to adapt a piece of work for a different medium and then mm. to, to try to speak the language of that medium and communicate in the way that that medium is meant to do it. So it's, it's a very interesting process to see that. And, you know, I read Hamilton, the, the book, um, and I watched the show and I felt like I had a, a greater, richer understanding of the character, both, mm. uh, you know, the way they evoked him on stage and the way he's represented on the page. And I hope people will have that same experience, both reading our book and seeing the movie. Hmm. So you mentioned that in your book, you kind of told the story for the for the first time. If you distill it down, what do you think, at least from your perspective, are the are the main lessons for business leaders from this story? Never take for granted uh, the industry contours that you operate in. Uh, hmm. Don't think that the people you're competing against now are the people you're going to be competing with in the future. Technology, software is disrupting everything. Your competitor might be Apple, even though Apple has nothing to do with your business. Your competitor might be Google. Um, the monetization and creation out of thin air of data means that your business model might be entirely different because there's new ways of making money off of what you do. Photography was upended by math. Think about that. Photography became a math and a computing problem. Who would have ever yeah. thought that the camera makers would be competing against software companies yeah. or that everyone would become a photographer, but on handheld devices with, you know, the bare minimum uh, photographic capabilities of a, of a, you know, of a proper camera. Uh, don't take for granted the things that seem etched in stone. Like with BlackBerry, they have these monolithic, giant, rich, powerful carriers and how the carriers defined the world was was what they lived in and you know but what if the telcos get um disrupted or if they get disintermediated it's a new new game and so you always have to be mindful of not only the existing competitors but the unseen competitors and don't take for granted the four walls around you and the ground underneath you is will always be there and if it starts to shake and tremor, you have to start to think, okay, what's our contingency plan? Mm -hmm. So I think every company needs forward thinking people who are a little bit paranoid and who question and uh, question all the assumptions and can push back and, and live in the world of the what if. Now that doesn't mean you should trade, you should chase every single innovation, every single change. That's the hard part. Some of these things are just murmurs. It's like clubhouse. Remember clubhouse? It came out a couple of years ago and yeah, and everyone was using Clubhouse for like three months. 
And this was oh. going to be the new way of things. And now what's Clubhouse? People don't even talk. It's now a joke. It's like MySpace, right? So uh, a social network. I mean, MySpace was a failure. Facebook is huge. But who's to say Facebook is going to be something that our kids all want to use? They don't. So what's going to happen as we get older? Or Google. Look at Google. Google became the all-powerful uh, advertising and search engine. And now we have ChatGPT and everyone's saying, well, what's going to happen to Google? Um, so you know, OpenAI comes uh, comes out with ChatGPT, and overnight, um, companies that are in the business of uh, of providing student aids, um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, you know textbooks or whatnot, are suddenly vulnerable because mm. now you've got all this great information at your fingertips. So there's lots of destabilizing forces out there, and everyone needs to be paranoid in business all the time. I think more so than ever. So similar to Ben's question, Sean, what are the lessons for investors? Buckle up. <laughs> read up. Uh, inform yourself. Read religiously all the news. Find new news sources. Um, read up on AI. How is AI? Qu question what you're invested in now and how the business dynamics of that could change. Um Oil and gas is an interesting one. Who thought that oil and gas would be disrupted by, uh, you know, if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, who thought that the oil and gas business would be going through this um, uh, crossroads they're at now where um, the world, but, 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 you know, the oil and gas business will probably be a great place for investors for the next couple of decades still. So how, how do you, like, that's an example of a business that's being disrupted, but what's the pace of disruption, Right. And it's for the betterment of the planet, frankly. But, you know, if you're an investor with a 10-year horizon, maybe oil and gas investments are the best things out there. I, I, I just cite that as an example, purely hypothetically. Uh, I just think you need, to, you need to arm yourself with more knowledge and uh, question your own assumptions. Um, you know, the banks, look what everyone thinks the banks are rock solid, but it turns out that the, the, the business uh, of banks is not loans or savings accounts, it's confidence. And when the confidence goes away, like what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, you don't have a bank anymore. It just goes away overnight, quickly. So, or commercial real estate, you know, that's been a bedrock investment. I actually worry for all the pension funds because they own so much commercial real estate. And here we all are working from home. And um, those office buildings are probably going to be devalued. They're going to be worth less. I don't think it's happened yet. I think it's just starting to happen. Mm -hmm. So how are our cities going to change? So I think everyone has to arm up a little bit uh, and 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 do their research and ask the tough questions and try to navigate this. I don't think there's a silver bullet, or an obvious answer, but I think we just need to be mindful. And, you know, like anyone who's an investor asks, what are the areas that are oversold? Where, where are the opportunities people don't see yet? And, um, you know, a, a managed uh, account would have um would have a portfolio and and you know you place a few bets here and there you don't put everything on one stock you know you put maybe a bit in real estate a bit in energy a bit in technology and so on and so forth and then within those portfolios you would carve it out a little bit more um early stage later stage and so on and so forth you know although you know if you're in, if you're have an etf then uh so my question is how are how is etf management? here's a question for you how is etf management going to change uh, do we continue to rely on the algorithms and the and the programs that have worked marvelously well for decades, or do you think that that's going to require some tweaking? Uh, if if indeed the world is being disrupted uh, to such a degree, I'll, I'll give you my interpretation of of the investor takeaways after reading your book, um, which I think answers your answers your your question about ETFs. The the, the big thing for me re reading it was idiosyncratic risk. I mean, you look at RIM with just th this fantastic company, and like you just articulated, it continued to be a fa fantastic company, but Apple just just basically blew them up. And we could argue maybe they could have responded differently. I don't know, but it's, it wasn't, wasn't obvious, and it wouldn't have been obvious to investors either. So idi idiosyncratic risk matters, and it shows up with, with an individual company, not even necessarily an individual sector. Uh, so, And then as you just mentioned, diversification is one of the ways to solve that. Um, when you look at the history of technological innovation with respect to investing, in, in public markets at least, the innovative sectors and companies tend to give terrible returns to investors. I mean, you look at railways 
um, versus software over the last, I don't know, 50, 75 years. Railways is an industry of decline significantly. Software has exploded, but railways outperform software historically. Um, so I think by owning the whole market, when you own everything, because that's when we talk about ETFs, we're, we're typically referring to just owning the market. So when you own the market, you, you own the disruptive industries, you own the declining industries. The declining one t ones tend to outperform, which is super counterintuitive, but it's the way it tends to go. And, uh, but then there will be superstar companies that come out like Amazon or like Apple within the disruptors. Right. But if you own everything, you own the declining industries, you own the disruptors, including the companies that happen to be the ones that go to the moon, you're in pretty good shape. So I, I don't think that, I don't think that has changed um, with, with the current state of the world. Interesting. Well, congratulations again, Sean. Looking forward to the movie, which comes out tomorrow, if you listen to this, on the 11th when this show was released. So looking forward to that very much. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate this. Thanks, Sean. Carl, well, that was pretty cool, Ben, to have two guests, one episode, two very yeah, different guests. I mean, lo lots of fun. Two, two really interesting conversations. Yeah, so it's great to have Sean join us. Um, so this is the after show. I want to talk about you becoming more active and I would say a little more assertive on Twitter. I, I don't know. I, I, I occasionally have inspiration to write Twitter threads. And I did a couple recently, and uh, people seem to like them. Lots of fun. And I'm going to put a plug out for you. You put your Calendly link. Well, I did as well, but I'll plug yours. Your Calendly link in your Twitter profile. So if someone wanted to take advantage of that, I'm just saying it's there to be to be taken advantage of. I don't know. I, learned, I don't know if I like the idea of being taken advantage of, but thank you for the plug. Take advantage of, of the opportunity to get a chance to talk to you. Anyways, um, I, you know what I learned this week? There's advisors in Canada who aren't allowed to recommend index funds by their mm. company. Mm -hmm. Just blew me away. Um, we're going to be I mean, that, that, that's one way to solve the, uh, the whole uh, deferred sales charge issue. Like index funds never paid the back-end load DSC commissions, right? And now those are gone. So maybe the next, uh, now you just outlaw index funds altogether. Got to find a way to keep money in the high fee products somehow. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's still incredible to me, given all the evidence. Anyway. It, yeah, it's, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a real problem. So I shared on Twitter uh, today the uh, Future Proof announced officially, we knew this, but it's been now official, officially announced that we're going to be doing a live recording at the Future Proof conference this fall. So any advisors that are considering going, and I'd love to meet you and see you there. We're going to have our special guest, Hal Hirschfield, is going to join us in that live recording, which is pretty cool. Hal has become a good friend of, of us and the show. So I mentioned the rail service earlier. I went to Toronto by train. I think I, I dropped you a note. I'm not going to do that again. This country desperately needs, I don't know if we can afford it, but we desperately need high-speed rail, in the especially the corridor between Quebec City and, and Windsor, I guess. But it's just so slow, and the, the train is just so old and clickety-clackety, and it's can't work. You can't write. It's just, it just doesn't. Today's day and age, you, you, it's, it's just not great. It was on time, though. I will say that it was on time. So I knew what That's I was getting good. into. So this is a, a shame on me. Uh, what, what do you make of the news that Robinhood is going to be going to 24-hour trading for some limited securities? Apparently, it's from 8 in the morning on Monday till 8 p.m. on Friday. You'll be able to trade starting I think Monday the 16th, Monday the 12th. Uh, anyways, be able to trade more than 40 stocks and ETFs, including Apple and Tesla. This is an exciting yeah. upgrade, apparently, that allows you to take advantage of opportunities no matter what time of day they arise. I just can't wait for the research paper that comes out looking at the difference in returns <laughs> between people who trade during normal hours and people who trade during off hours. Um, someone recommended the podcast Goodfellas to me this week, which I'd never heard of, bad on me, because this is a regular podcast you listen to, but it's fantastic. It is. John 
John Cocker, Neil Ferguson, and H.R. McMaster. It's really civilized. I love their debate. I love how they change each other's minds. They're not locked into their positions. Yeah, um, that's a good podcast. So what's your other top podcast that you listen to? Silence. No other main ones you listen to? Nope. Wow. Not even like Lex Friedman? Nope. Conversation with Tyler? Sometimes. Okay. Sam Harris? Nope. Used to, but nope. Yeah, a lot I listen to a lot less. One of the things I've noticed is that I do a lot of podcast searching based on the topic or the speaker, which is interesting. Like I wanted to do some research this week on Craig Wartman, professor at Kellogg. And uh, so I just looked up his name and he's on a lot of interesting podcasts and had very different um, conversations, different podcasts. That's kind of cool. I do that quite often. Well, I do that for guests. If we have a yeah. guest coming up, then I'll go and find all of their past podcast appearances and listen to them. Yeah. But even if you're reading a book, right, you can go check out the author. I like mm -hmm. doing that. So I find I'm doing that more and more, just kind of doing a, a end run on it. Um, let's go through some of the recent reviews. You want to do the first one? Sure. Uh, John Ota from the United States says, great investing podcast. Highly recommended. Great guests being asked excellent questions. Well-researched deep dives on relevant investing questions and in-depth book reviews, all backed by hosts who don't speak down to their audience. It's good. Mm -hmm. The number of times Ben and Cameron or one of their guests have raised the raised and expanded upon a question I wasn't fully aware of is astounding. For example, the popular definitions of risk based on volatility never felt entirely satisfying. Listening to the Rash Reminder has improved my understanding of how to better define and quantify risk in a way no other source has. That's pretty cool. After mm -hmm. following the podcast for a year and listening to many episodes on a wide range of topics, I have never once had the desire to skip one. It's a pretty good compliment. That's pretty cool. Thomas Warfield from the United States said, best personal finance pod around. Absolutely fantastic pod. They have a great deal of respect for their listeners, which I absolutely appreciate. This is by far the best personal finance pod I've ever listened to. I mean, the thing is, and maybe the, the Rational Reminder community is an even more concentrated version of this, although I doubt that. Our listeners are really smart. Like I'm, I'm, the, I'm the dumb guy trying to learn from other people in the Rational Reminder community. The people that listen to this podcast are, <laughs> they're very smart. Yeah. So that, that is why, uh, that is why we don't speak down to our audience and have a great deal of respect for our listeners. Um, and our guests. And our guests, definitely. Uh, R Ricard Zero CP from Canada says, great podcast. The content has had a profound impact on the way I approach personal investments and happiness. And the insights have encouraged me to think more critically about my own choices. Hosts never interrupt their guests and let them complete their ideas. I'm grateful for the time and energy you both put into creating such valuable content. Keep up the excellent work, and I look forward to continuing to learn more from your content. Very, very nice. nice. Um, speaking of very nice, had a couple of people kindly reach out to me on LinkedIn. Christine from Massachusetts said she just checked out the pod and can't wait for the next episode. Well, you can go back through 250 <laughs> two episodes, I guess, plus your crypto series. And then Jordan Toronto thinks it is excellent and finds it truly one of the most informative sources for financial information. So I love hearing from people on LinkedIn. I don't know about you, but I've had a couple of people reach out lately offering uh, a service to source guests for us, which I, I kindly say this is something we enjoy doing ourselves. So all of our guests, we find ourselves. It's all homegrown energy that we do. Yep. I get pitched sometimes too, but that's, it's not, not a path that we plan on taking anytime soon. No, no. Uh, reminder meetups, Los Angeles, September 9th, Toronto, September 20th. And any follow up on the Edmonton possibility? Uh, um, well, Braden, I think is confirmed to be speaking at that conference. So he'll, he'll be there. And I, intend to go there also but we have that overlap issue where yeah. we've got to be in toronto for the first day of the edmonton conference so i've just got to decide if i want to i guess like fly to toronto for five hours or something and then fly straight to edmonton sounds kind of terrible but uh probably will do that probably 
that's I'm talking about my future self though. So we'll see how future Ben <laughs> feels about that decision. <laughs> so funny. All right. Anything else on your mind this week? Uh, no, no. It was really cool to have uh, to have that whole cycle, I guess I could call it, with uh, with Paul, where where we kind of I wanted to learn about covered calls, and I remembered that his paper had looked at that, so read back through the paper, used it in our piece, and then to be able to reach out to Paul and ask if he'd come on. Um, yeah. and having him review the notes on cover calls, that whole thing was, was just awesome. I mean, that's, that's one of the cool things about having this podcast is that we have people like that, that are in the community, yep. that are willing to engage and willing to help. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think it's probably good for, um, good for Paul to have his research talked about like that. I mean, he even talked about that on when, when we were on, yep. that that's kind of the impact that he wants to have. So that, I mean, that whole thing is just really, uh personally rewarding and I, I just think it's a it's a really cool aspect of having this whole thing plus you had a lot of engagement on that on twitter a lot of people reached in, in chatting about that yep yep cover calls is a big deal wait till i do the csi video on that people are gonna be... <laughs> so apparently this is like uh, apparently covered calls is on the same level as dividends in some circles really yeah oh yeah that's what i've been told <laughs> Wow, you're really going to be the skunk at that garden party. Uh, it sounds like it. Yeah, it sounds like it. I also did a I did a Twitter thread on structured products. Mm. That that was interesting. I I wasn't expecting a lot. Most most people on there were agreeing. Like, yes, these things are generally garbage, which was my argument. Not that they're all garbage all the time, and not that they're never useful. Just that for the most part, retail investors are getting hosed in structured products, and I think we'll do a. We'll do a rational minder episode on that in the future, um, but the thing that surprised me is that there are a lot of people who were defending them um, and were, you know, dividend level upset about about the evidence. Like I, there were I don't know how many papers, eight papers maybe that looked at big samples of structured products and showed that relative to the underlying payoffs, investors, retail investors, were overpaying f between four and eight percent, depending on the paper for the for the payoffs in these products but then there are people coming in saying you know you don't know what you're talking about structured products are good <laughs> it's just the evidence it's just the evidence yeah anyway anything else uh nope i think All we're right. i think we're good awesome thanks everybody for joining us this week mm -hmm.